the true-born Englishman. Most of you, those with whom I'm personally acquainted or have seen me at other events, know of my Slavic, Russian, Balkan identity. Right, I have roots from one side of my family in that part of the world. I work on Russia, former Soviet states. This is what brought me in contact with Salpi and the Armenian Institute here. And probably having plied me with some Armenian liquor, Salpi and her staff induced me. They probably just asked me, what's this English? Why is your name English? I probably said one or two provocative things. And the next thing I know, I'm going to speak about the true-born Englishman, the other half of my identity. That's me, no doubt. Nobody could possibly be more English than somebody named Robert English, a proud son of the Anglo-Saxon race, the race that ruled the civilized world, that planted its superior seed in colonies such as these United States, and established a lineage that today, we are warned, is in peril of being subsumed, of being dissolved in a sea, in waves of inferior immigrant races. Adios America, as some of my apparently prescient WASP co-nationals warn us. WASP, that stands for White Anglo-Saxon Protestant. And Anglo-Saxon is surely the heart of Englishness. And I have the names to prove it. Robert. This is derived from the old German, the Germanic or the Saxon, Hrodebert, which means bright fame. Hrod, fame. Barat, bright. And my last name too. What could be more English than the name English itself? Except this is where my identity problems began. Because it turns out that English is not really an English name at all. It's actually Irish. So it tars me with some admixture of this Catholic Celtic race. How could English be an Irish name? Here's how. Some irritating thing called the historical record, gets in the way of good stories all the time, um, revealed that an ancestor of mine named Tom probably a good fellow at heart, but with a particular weakness, in London or thereabouts in the early 17th century, old Tom couldn't help but patronize day or night the burgeoning number of pubs and alehouses in the greater London area. And this behavior presently landed him in the city jail. But prolonged residence at the city's expense did not produce the coming forward of relatives to pay off his debts that had been hoped for. So one fine day, good old Tom, together with other miscreants and ne'er-do-wells, was loaded on a ship which crossed the sea and unloaded this human cargo into central Ireland. There my ancestor apparently did much to distinguish himself, perhaps by introducing the locals to the pleasures of round-the-clock inebriation such that he became known locally as Tom the Englishman. Some notoriety came from England. Tom the English. Tom English. Hence the surname was born. Even as Tom's seed was subsumed, was fully assimilated in Catholic Ireland. Right? This line of my lineage was fully assimilated to the Irish race, if you will, Irish Catholic religion and Irish culture. Hence, English is an Irish name. Horrors, thought young Robert, or Frodebert, as I insisted my playmates call me, in order to distinguish myself from this Celtic stain. So I focused elsewhere. I had other grandparents, after all, whose lineage could surely be traced, not to the Emerald Isle, but to Great Britain. There were the Clarks, unmistakably English, even though their name also contained a hint of a different kind of scandal. It wasn't only that this name betrayed their chosen profession, right? Small-time shopkeepers, nothing much noble in that. But it was that my branch of the Clarks had been missionaries, had been evangelicals, who set out to convert the heathen, 
in dangerous parts of the world, such as Jamaica, a crown colony, of course, where some or all of the Clarks apparently yielded to this family weakness for drink, sampling gin, coming to know the pleasures of rum, and apparently many of them began mixing their seed with that of the dusky natives. So one branch of this family, in order to flee yet another scandal, took off for yet another part of the British, of the Queenslands, that would be British Canada. Well, there wasn't much nobility in this Clark family tale, so young Rodebert turned to yet another undeniably British branch of my lineage. That would be the Scottish. That's, that's right, another one of my grandparents carried the name Fraser, that of the famed Highland clan Fraser, whose leading scion bears the title Lord Lovat, a noble peerage sitting in the House of Lords, presumably protecting the realm from the unrestrained passions of the commoners. But this was confusing too, because everyone knows the Celtic, not Anglo-Saxon Scots, had spent centuries fighting the English. And upon further investigation into that annoying thing called the historical record, it turned out that one of Clan Fraser's leaders, Simon Fraser, the 11th Lord Lovat, had been convicted of treason, beheaded, and even worse, lost the family title, the family castle, for his troubles. By the way, that was only reacquired decades later by other Frasers at considerable expense. Everything was for sale. It turns out that this ignoble predecessor, Simon Fraser, the 11th Lord Lovat, changed his religion from Catholic to Protestant and back three times in the tussle between the would-be restorers of the Stuart monarchy and the forces of Oliver Cromwell. And if that weren't enough, again, that irritating historical record revealed another flaw at the heart of this Scottish fighting Highlander identity. Because instead of stretching back hundreds of years into antiquity, it turns out that much of it had been made up in the preceding decades. The bagpipes were stolen from Ireland. The kilt that any self-respecting Highlander traded in for a pair of trousers as soon as he could afford them was suddenly the garment of choice at every public gathering. And those ancient tartans that graced those kilts, it turns out, had been designed just a few years before, often by English fabric designers, in a rush of late 19th century Scottish romanticism that helped prompt deserved ridicule as the invention of tradition. If you've ever seen the Scottish national team play football, soccer, you know the match is preceded by a stirring rendition of Flower of Scotland, which proudly recalls the Battle of Bannockburn, where in 1314 the Scots met proud Edward's army and sent him homewards to think again. Actually, they sent the English back to round up a much bigger army and come back and crush the Scots, but no matter. An even more interesting and intense celebration of the nation through its martial, its military glory is found in the anthem, Scotland the Brave. Consider the first four lines of that song, and indulge me in a put-upon accent. Let Italy boast of her gay gilded waters, her bowers and her vines, and her soft sunny skies, her sons drinking love from the eyes of her daughters, where freedom expires amid softness and sighs. Well, goodness, thank, thank the great Almighty that we don't have gilded waters and sunny skies in Scotland. Seriously, though, in our younger days, we all loved the stirring martial melody of Scotland the Brave. But think, what nation 
in order to feel good about itself, has to spend the first four lines of its national anthem putting down another country, another people, poor Italy in this case. The entire first verse is dedicated to picking on Italy, really. Her sons drinking love from the eyes of their daughters, where freedom expires amid softness and sighs. Is this simply jealousy of Italy's beauty, undeniable, natural and cultural beauty? Or maybe it's resentment that no one really cared enough to invade Scotland more than a handful of times, whereas Italy was invaded and conquered by everyone from the Etruscans, the Greeks, the Romans, through centuries down to Saracens, Spanish, and French. And each of these invaders, by the way, left their seed as well. So it's as silly to speak of an Italian race as it is of an English one. Well, by now, the points I'm trying to make in this roundabout way are clear. And I've taken you on this little trip through my own identity crisis to emphasize two points above all. One is both the sadness or the pity as well as the danger when one nation's glory or pride can only be highlighted by denigrating another's, when one's very identity is defined primarily in opposition to another nation or people. But my second and larger point is on the malleability, we can say social construction, as Dave Kang did just before me, maybe even the artificiality of the nation itself. The nation, no nation can survive without myths of their people's singularity and purity. But the world cannot survive if we don't bear in mind that these nations are, to a great extent, precisely the product of myths. So let me close, let me move towards a conclusion, with an excerpt from the poem titled The True Born Englishman. It was written in 1701 by Daniel Defoe, better known as the author of Robinson Crusoe, correct. And Defoe wrote this poem in protest against a wave of English xenophobia, of anti-foreign settlement, of English nationalism that swept the realm at this time because of the victory of the Dutch King William at the Battle of the Boyne over James II, a victory that ensured the continued Protestant control or domination of the English crown. By the way, my own father, kind of perversely, he always went against the grain, did not like his children wearing green on St. Patrick's Day. He said, no, we celebrate July 12th, the Battle of the Boyne, and we wear orange. So my siblings and I, were the most pinched kids in Orange County, uh, believe me. In any case, let me quote in closing from Defoe's early 18th century poem titled The True Born Englishman. Thus from a mixture of all things began that heterogeneous thing, the Englishman in eager rapes and furious lust begot between a painted Briton and a Scot, whose gendered offspring quickly learned to bow and yoke their heifers to the Roman plow. From whence a mongrel half-breed race there came, with neither name nor nation, speech nor fame, in whose hot veins new mixtures quickly ran, infused betwixt a Saxon and a Dane, while their rank daughters with promiscuous lust, received all nations to their parents just. This nauseous brood directly did contain the well-extracted blood of Englishmen. Thank you.